let's see her here. She has a really good talk today about accessible software design. Leonie is an expert on accessible software, on, um, uh, I can't find the word. Good thing, blank on a word on stage. <laughs> um, inclusive design, and she's a member of the W3C advisory board. Her talk today is called A Bag of Spanners, so let's give a huge hand for Leonie Watson. Okay, it's all right. Good morning, everybody, how are you? Hey, <laughs> it's wonderful to be here eventually after a few uh, unlucky events. Um, Joy of Coding is a really great idea, a great concept for a conference. And it got me thinking about what Joy of Coding means to me. And I think it's two things. One, it's about the joy of creating something that more people can use than you might have originally planned. And then personally, of course, there's the joy of using something that somebody built because they thought about accessibility. And it means I can use it as a blind person. So joy has two very distinct meanings for me. Sorry, we have okay. Okay. What happened? We have no video. Oh, second. okay. Did it go to sleep? Where is that? What can you hear? Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm just. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> so, yes, joy has, has two very distinct meanings for me. And so I am going to talk about accessibility. But before I get to that, I want to make an important point. I'm going to talk about accessibility for people like me who are blind and use screen readers to listen to content instead of look at it. And I'm also going to talk a lot about code accessibility. But I don't want you to think for a minute that that's all there is to accessibility. It's everybody's responsibility, whether you're a product owner, a user researcher, a designer, a developer, a QA tester. And the reason that it's everybody's responsibility is because it helps everybody. Whether someone like me who has a disability now Someone like yourselves in the future when you're a little bit older and maybe don't see or hear so well. Someone like maybe yourselves now when you have a broken arm or repetitive strain injury or a migraine or any of those other things that temporarily can mean we don't see or hear or think or move as well as we usually do. So accessibility really is for everybody and therefore it needs to be done by everybody. But right now we're going to talk about accessible code and accessible development. Okay, so accessibility, if you're a developer, is really part of your toolkit. And I should take a moment to explain the title of this talk. You may have a phrase similar here in the Netherlands, but in the UK, we say something is like a bag of spanners. When it looks really organized and well-built from the outside, but as soon as you open it up, it looks like somebody threw everything into a bag and gave it a really bloody good shake. And, and you're like, oh, wow, you know, uh, I read all these articles and, and this accessibility stuff, you know, everybody says it's easy and it's effortless. And yet when I try, it kind of just always feels a bit messy and I don't really know what I'm doing. Uh, and so I'd like to, to try and help work through some of those ideas and give you some practical ideas about things you can do to turn your bag of spanners into a useful part of your development toolkit. So there's another idea I want to share with you, and that's the idea of cause and effect. Now, I'm not going to give you a lecture on Newtonian physics, but it's very, very true. The decisions that you make as developers have an effect on my experience and others as consumers of the things that you build. So you need to think very carefully about the choices you make. Sometimes you won't always be the one making those choices. You might work for an agency or a company that has made decisions about the framework you're using or the code style you're using, or you might be working on a legacy product. 
but there are always little things you can do. And the more you can understand about the power that you wield as a developer, uh, the better effect you can cause to happen. So I'm going to talk about three different things, uh, mechanics, interaction, and construction. And we'll start with mechanics, because a lot of accessibility for screen reader users comes from the way the browser works with the assistive technology, like a screen reader. So it begins with things called platform accessibility APIs. These are not JavaScript APIs, so they're not ones that we can use as developers, but they are available on every platform, Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Linux, and they're used by software applications. And what they're used for is to query accessibility information. Back in the day, going back 15, 20 years ago, an awful lot of guesswork used to go into telling a blind person what they were dealing with on screen. If there was a rectangular thing on screen and there were three or four more things of the same shape, all on a horizontal line, the screen reader would guess that that was probably a toolbar or a menu bar. And that's pretty much how everything worked, until these APIs came along in the late 90s, when instead of guessing what something on screen was, the screen reader could say to the browser or the application or to the operating system, tell me what this thing is, what state is it in, give me all the accessibility information you can. So stuff got a lot easier at that point. And in terms of browsers and the web, this information comes from a structure known as an accessibility tree. Uh, what happens when you load up an HTML document into the browser is the browser gets really busy. It does a whole ton of stuff. One of the things it does is build the document object model, the DOM tree, and it'll also build a parallel structure called the accessibility tree. And it's like the DOM, but instead of having information about the content, it has accessibility information about the content. And that's the place where the screen reader will use the platform accessibility APIs to get the relevant information from. And so we call this semantics, or accessibility semantics, is the, the general term we use for this information. And there are three typical bits of information included in that. The first is a role, and that is uh, an element's purpose. Oh, sorry, no, let me backtrack a bit. Uh, there are different kinds of semantics. I should get this bit in first, shouldn't I? Uh, there are implicit semantics. So when you use a lot of HTML elements, uh, they have accessibility information built in for free, which means you as a developer don't need to do anything. When you use these elements, the browser knows what they are, what they're for, and all that information gets stored in the accessibility tree. Sometimes that doesn't exist, though, and we need to use uh, explicit semantics. And this is where we can use something like accessible, rich internet applications to apply accessibility semantics specifically. This might be because you want to build something that doesn't exist in HTML, like a set of tab panels or a menu bar, or it might be because you want to create a state that doesn't exist in HTML. There are lots of good reasons why you might want to explicitly apply some semantic information. So I said there were three different sorts of information, and the first of these is role. Uh, a role describes uh, an element's purpose. Uh, so when you want to know what an element does, it's the role that does the job. Sorry, I'm having terrible trouble with these slides. Okay, there we go, try that again. Uh, yeah, so a role of an element is what describes what it does. And quite often, you can tell this from the name of the element. So if we take a simple example, uh, we can see the button element. Uh, you probably won't be at all surprised to discover that the role of a button element is, well, to produce a button. And that's the information I need to be told and the information that will be available to you visually because you're looking at something that, well, looks like a button on screen. And that information there, button, is what my screen reader will tell me I'm dealing with. And it gets that from the accessible tree in the browser. The next bit of information is name. Not every HTML element has an accessible name, but most interactive ones do. And a button, of course, is an interactive element. So the text that goes inside the button gives it its accessible name. This is the bit that tells me what's different about this button as opposed to the other buttons that might be on the same page. And again, the screen reader grabs this information from the browser, and I get to hear even more information. Shell has 
So I now get two bits of information. I know what this button is for and I know it's a button and that sets up some expectations about what it is and what I'm gonna do with it. And then the last bit we have is state. It's current condition. And again, there are lots of HTML attributes that let us do this, checked for radio buttons or checkboxes, for example. But there aren't many, actually, that apply to a button element. So we can use this to show you some of the ARIA. We can explicitly apply a state using the ARIA pressed attribute. And this will let me know now what state the button's in. Is it pressed or not pressed? So we can use this, this gets it true or false, true when it's pressed, false when it's not. And this does an interesting thing. It actually changes the role of the button. So you'll hear in a minute, instead of hearing just button, I now know that it's a toggle button, i.e. one that can be pressed or not pressed. And so in three pieces of information, I've got access to the same information that's almost certainly visually really obvious on the page. And with the exception of that last attribute, it's all just there in the HTML for free. Nothing we have to do that's particularly uh, extra or difficult. So if we take another example, the nav element, uh, this too has a role and you probably won't be surprised to discover that it'll tell me that it's a navigation area or a navigation region of the page. Yeah. And there are lots of elements like this that came along in HTML5 for the first time. Uh, nav, main, header, footer, and they're what we call landmark elements because they tell screen readers about big landmarks on the page, the key important areas of content. And screen readers have lots of shortcuts for letting you navigate content too. And one of them lets you navigate between these areas. So in just two or three key presses, I can often move around a whole web page and discover that it has got you know, one, two navigation blocks, a main content area, header, footer, and all the others that are really obvious when you look at a page just quickly at a glance when it first loads up. But there's more we can do with this. We can build on the role of the nav element by giving it an accessible name, this time using ARIA again and the ARIA label attribute. It's not uncommon for websites to have multiple navigation blocks on a page, so how do you tell the difference? Uh, you looking at it will probably know the difference because you'll be able to glance at what's inside it. But for me, a little bit of helping information is useful, so we give it an accessible name. And this time, we're just going to define what purpose the navigation block has. So brilliant, a little bit more information, simple steps towards a really usable, accessible experience. We can now put a list inside our nav blog. Lists do all sorts of lovely things when it comes to accessibility and semantics. Uh, the UL, or OL if you happen to use one of those, has a role of lists, so we know what it is. The list items have a role of list items. And what's really nice is that the browser counts up how many list items there are inside the list, and that information gets made available to me as well. So again, coming back to that idea, at a glance, someone cited can see there's two or three things in this list, or maybe there are 97, uh, but this tells me the same information, and we can both use that information to make decisions about what we want to do next in terms of our interaction. And the bullets indicate to me that this is an unordered list. If it had been an OL, uh, I might have heard the one, two, three, or A, B, or C, depending on the list style type that was used. So we can build all this into a navigation block that gives us a lot of information about the type of content that's on page. And you might have heard there was actually an extra bit of information in there because of the anchor elements, which again, my screen reader recognized was a, a, a link and told me so. Again, all that information in the accessibility tree. But you might be thinking, there's something missing from this as a typical navigation block, and you'd be right. What we very often do is visually style the link that represents the currently displayed page to call it out, make it distinct. For a long time, there wasn't really any good way to do that programmatically for screen reader users. We had to hack it with hidden text, and it was all pretty horrible. But now there is a very useful attribute called ARIA current that lets me discover which thing is the current one in the set. So in this case, the current link within the navigation block. Website navigation region. 
So it's a really nice bundle of information just using uh, actually three pieces, uh, sorry, two pieces of information in this case, just roll a name in lots of different ways, gives me plenty of information that's the equivalent of what's on screen visually. If we look at a slightly more complex example and form fields, specifically radio buttons, we can see the same things in action here. Uh, the input element doesn't have a role itself, but when you add a type attribute, uh, you do get a role. In the case of a radio button with a type of radio, the role is radio button. And we can also figure out how many there are in the set, because the name attribute, if it has the same value for all the radio buttons in the set, will act like list items do in a list. The browser will add them up and tell how many, uh, how many radio buttons there are in the set. We've also got an accessible name, but this one's a little different. You'll remember in the button, the accessibility name came from the text inside the button element itself. With form fields, it almost always comes from the content of a label element that's separate from the input element. Because it's separate, we've got to join them up though. Otherwise, the browser doesn't know that they belong to each other and neither will my screen reader. So the best way to do this, the most robust way, is to use a for attribute on the label element and an id attribute on the input element and give them exactly the same value. And that creates a pair, an association in the code that the browser represents in the accessibility tree and the screen reader grabs and tells me. So the result is we get a lot of information stacking up to give me the whole picture. And again, we heard that the radio buttons are not checked, so we've got state being added into the mix here, as well as role and name. The thing about radio buttons, though, is that they more often not come as a group to let you answer an overarching question. And in that example that we just heard then, uh, no question was mentioned. Uh, often it's visually displayed above and quite prominently um, before the radio buttons. But again, we need to create an association in the code, otherwise the browser doesn't understand that they all belong to each other and neither does my screen reader. So the best way to do this, if you can, is to use a field set attribute, make the first child of the field set a legend attribute, and that becomes the accessible name for the whole group. And then stick all your radio buttons, just as we saw before, inside your field set. And we get another layer of information then. We get a group of radio buttons with an accessible name that tells me what the radio buttons are asking. And then we get all that information about the radio buttons that lets me answer and make the choice I want to, like this. But the code is really important, as I said, it's all these associations, all these relationships that get built up in the code that's really incredibly important. If we take another example, again, a slightly more complicated one, and that of a data table, uh, there's a lot of elements that go on here, so a lot of different roles that come into play. We've got a table element, which of course has a role of table, that's what it's there for. But inside that, we have TR elements that give us the rows, we have TH elements, which give us the column headers or row headers, and these are important, and I'll explain why in a moment. And then, of course, we have TD cells inside just for the content of the table. And your table might also have a caption. Uh, the caption is what gives a table its accessible name. So, again, a slightly different way of providing that accessible name information. The TH elements are particularly important because they create a very necessary association of information. Visually, when you're looking at a data table, there's a good chance you will scan perhaps down the left-hand column until you find the row that has the data you're looking for, and then you might visually scan across that row until you kind of get to the column you think has the information you want, and you might casually flick a glance back up to the top row just to confirm that, yep, you're in the right column as well. Doing that when you can't see the screen, obviously, is a bit difficult. So by using the TH elements, we let the screen reader do that row and column header checking for you. And the result is that a screen reader user, using more of the many shortcuts that are available, can actually move up and down through columns, left and right through rows, and all the while, the browser and the screen reader are working together to create the information, paradigms, and associations that you need.
And it's true for anyone who's ever met me, we'll verify this is my tea consumption. But you might have heard there that there was lots of information. You know what column you were in, what row you were in, and what the purpose of the information in the cell you were focused on was, whether it was you know, somebody's name and then their tea and coffee consumption, or whether you were browsing through the tea column and finding out what each individual person drank. And this is all down to that code creating the relationships that are so very, very necessary. That takes us on then to interaction, because it's all very well knowing what something is, and that gives you clues as to how you might be able to interact with it or what you might want to be able to do with it. But the next step, of course, is that you've got to be able to do that. So in terms of interaction, we have similar concepts as with semantics. Uh, some HTML elements have interactive keyboard support, well, interactive support for everything, whether it's uh, touch or mouse or keyboard. These are things like links and buttons and form fields and such. Sometimes, though, we don't always use those elements in quite the right way, or sometimes we repurpose elements, divs and spans, most obviously, and so that's when we need to use JavaScript to provide all the necessary interaction, again, whether it's for mouse, keyboard, touch and such. Almost always, mouse interaction is provided because it's kind of the common ground. It's what most people tend to assume is the default for everybody. So the one you've got to watch out for really is, is keyboard support and in certain circumstances, touch support. Browsers a lot of the time will handle touch for you once you've dealt with mouse interaction. Keyboard's the one that almost always goes missing somewhere along the line. So if we go back to our button element, uh, we'll find something that's interesting. Uh, although you do still have to use some JavaScript to provide the click functionality, you actually don't have to think about keyboard at all because the browser does that. It will take whatever event or functionality you've attached to the click event and it will automatically make it work when someone uses a keyboard. Specifically, when someone uses the enter or the space key to activate the button. So, although, yes, button elements do need a little bit of script to work, as a developer, you don't need to think particularly about doing anything specific for keyboard users. So it's nice and neat, nice and easy. Sometimes, though, we don't necessarily always use button elements when we should. Uh, we often see this pattern. We use anchors to act as buttons under the hood. So something starts off as a link. Um, it might be styled to look like a button. And in these cases, we've got to do a little bit of extra work. The reason for this is, although a link does work with the keyboard automatically, the browser will do that for you, uh, links only work with the enter key. They don't work with the space key. And this one is important because if someone comes along and thinks this is a button and they try to use the space key to activate it and the space key isn't supported, what will happen is, is that their content will scroll. And that's really annoying because you've got to navigate your way back to the button and, and yeah, it just adds aggravation to the experience. So again, you just need to listen out for the extra key codes with your JavaScript to make sure that as well as the default support for the enter key provided by the browser, you're listening out for someone pressing the space key and attaching the functionality to that as well. So it's not too difficult, but it's a really, really important step to take. Things get even more interesting, though, because what very often happens with this pattern is that the anchor doesn't have an href attribute. Now, the href attribute is incredibly important for keyboard accessibility of links and links that are pretending to be buttons. It's the href attribute that makes it possible to use the tab key to navigate to a button. So this is not just about screen reader users, uh, it's actually about all keyboard users. Uh, if you use the tab key to navigate around and you can't get to a button, you can't focus on it, well, you can't use it. So it's pretty fundamental that if you don't have the href there, you've got to do something to enable someone to focus on the button. And, of course, without the href, you have absolutely no functionality at all. No mouse functionality, no keyboard functionality, no nothing. So your JavaScript has to do all the heavy lifting itself. We can fix this by using the tab index attribute on the anchor, tab index equals zero. We'll just make it focusable in the natural position in the DOM. And yep, all your JavaScript needs to provide the click event handling, the uh, key press event handling, and, and all the rest. So it's all degrees of customization. The more you move into the area, want to stray away from the original intended purpose of HTML, that's okay. We all have to do this. There are times when it's necessary. But just be prepared that it means there's a bit more work and a bit more responsibility that comes with it from your point of view. Sorry. 
So that takes us on to construction, the final piece in the puzzle. We've got to bring all these things together quite often into complex components. And as I said earlier, components that don't necessarily exist in HTML. There are times when we have to do all the hard work ourselves because we want to build something that doesn't really exist. So we'll take an example of a menu bar. Uh, this one is uh, actually using um, categories on my blog. I will say from the beginning, this is not a good use for a menu bar. Uh, menu bars should be for web applications, not websites. But this is kind of an easy, short example to show you of something that you might want to navigate in a kind of menu style. So because progressive enhancement is a good thing to do, uh, we start off with some good old school HTML underneath. And that's just some nested lists that reflect the structure of the ultimate menu bar we're going to build. So if your JavaScript fails, uh, you know, network latency, whatever, doesn't matter. There's some plain HTML with links in that people can fall back to, and they'll still be able to navigate and navigate uh, to the different parts of the information contained within the menu bar. So that's our fallback. It's our, our basic beginnings. But what we're going to do now is start building up a proper interactive menu bar. And we're going to start by explicitly applying some role information. ARIA has the role attribute, and it has a whole ton of values, about 70, nearly 80, I think, now in the most recent version. Pretty much every user interface component you can think of, there is a role that you can explicitly apply if you need to. You should go carefully with that, because overwriting an, uh, an implicit role is sometimes a dangerous thing to do. But in cases like this, it's absolutely necessary. So we can use the role of menu on the parent list. This sets up the idea that it's, uh, sorry, menu bar. This sets up the idea that the whole entity is a menu bar. And within that, we can use uh, a role of menu for the child menus inside it. And within that, again, we have menu items for the different bits within the menus. You might be wondering, if you're looking at the screen and seeing, why have the list items got a role of none on them? Uh, you could easily use role of presentation. The two things do the same thing. The reason is that the list items are important if you're looking at the fallback HTML, but we don't really need them for the, the, the composite widget that we're actually building. So we want to tell the browser, to tell the screen reader, actually, for this purpose, while the JavaScript is available and everything is working properly, uh, we don't really need you to know about the semantics of these list items. So just pretend they're not there. Um, so it effectively says, for now, this list item or these list items have no role. Then we can move on and we can add some accessible names. We've got the links acting as our, our menu items and the text inside those actually works really well as an accessible name, so a good native way to provide accessible names, just like the buttons at the start. But we can do a little bit more. We can use the ARIA label attribute again, like we did with the nav example, and we can explicitly apply an accessible name that just gives each of the child menus uh, the name of the menu itself. It's just reinforcing the same information. And finally, we can add in some states. Uh, it's going to be important to know when any of these menus is opened or expanded uh, or closed, uh, collapsed in other words. And here again, we can use some more ARIA, this time the ARIA expanded attribute. Uh, when it's set to true, it means that the menu is open, it's expanded. And similarly, when someone closes it, you can set it back to false and that will tell me that the state of the menu currently is closed. So again, we've built up the role, the name, and the state information. And this now should give us, you think, a fairly fully functioning menu bar. And indeed, this is what happens when we try to use it. So almost OK. We heard it was a menu, that there was a category submenu, and that there were one of two items uh, there in the menu bar in total. But that's where everything stopped, because uh, we got as far as our semantics, but what we haven't got yet is our interaction. And that little thwack noise you heard is my screen reader basically saying to the browser, OK, all the interaction now, it's over to you. Uh, which basically means the browser is going to you as developers, all right, <laughs> where's your JavaScript? Because all the interaction is stuff I need you to put in place now. Uh, it's because there is no menu bar element in HTML, so the, the browser can't provide the interaction automatically, so it has to be done explicitly in the JavaScript. To do this, uh, we want to put in place some very simple uh, keyboard commands. Uh, I won't show you all the script, they're not easy to fit on the slide, but you'll get the basic idea. We need to add support for the arrow keys so that someone can 
do just as you would do in a software application, uh, move left and right along the menu bar or up and down through the menus to open and close them. Uh, we want to be able to do things like escape to close a menu. That's a really nice thing to do for a keyboard user. It's much easier to be able to hit the escape key, have the menu close and have your focus returned to the parent item than it is to have to navigate all the way back there yourself. So we need to build in all this interaction using our JavaScript. But when we do, uh, we get something that looks a lot more like a fully functioning menu bar. And so it's really um, hard for me to describe just how joyful something like that really is. Uh, complex widgets are not easy to build. They're not easy to make accessible. And when they do come right, when they do offer me an experience like that where I know exactly what I'm dealing with, I know what's inside it, I know how many things there are, I can navigate around it really easily, and I can confidently make a selection from a menu bar, that's a really joyous experience for me as a consumer. And I think if you were the person responsible for building this, you'd be pretty happy about that outcome too, knowing that more people than you originally planned could use the widget that you've just spent time and effort building. So all the way, we've got these, these three things. We've got mechanics, semantics, interaction, and construction. And if you can keep thinking about these things as you are designing, building, developing things, you'll find that accessibility really starts to slot in very neatly uh, behind you. And of course, the more you can do this, the more you'll get used to it, and the more you won't have to think about it. It will just be the only way that you know how to do things. And that's the real challenge of accessibility. It's not that it's difficult so much, it can be sometimes, but it's unfamiliar. And if you can get over that unfamiliarity gap, it'll just become part of everything you do every day because that's just how you roll as a developer. And that, I think, is probably the real joy of accessible coding from my point of view. So thank you very much. <laughs>Thank you very much, Leonie. Everybody. I think I will be checking my blog source code this weekend and adding some area <laughs> attributes. <laughs>